Welcome to chapter 15. It's about working capital management. It's a chapter that I really like and really enjoy it. So some of the topics we'll cover are um, on the screen right here. It's a lot about inventory and receivables and cash management. You know, and it's really kind of interesting. I think a lot of people can relate to the topics of this uh, particular chapter. So just some reminders of some terminology. Way back in chapters like 1, 2, 3, we talked about some of these terms right here. I just want to make sure that you are aware of them and remember them. So working capital is your current assets. Remember what current assets are. Mostly inventory, receivables, cash. And your net working capital is current asset minus current liability. And then also remember the difference between net working capital and net operating working capital. Uh, with net operating working capital, it's just basically current assets minus current liability operating current liabilities and the, really the big difference is with net operating working capital you're backing out notes payable that's really the key thing that's different between net working capital and net operating working capital is you back out notes payable current notes payable for net operating working capital um, current asset investment policy is really trying to decide what level uh, of each type of current asset to hold um, and how to finance current assets. So how much inventory, cash, receivables, things like that, that you want to have on hand. And there's no right or wrong to it. It's just a matter of what the goals of the company are, what your industry is would matter, and how much risk or how much not risk does a company want to take. Uh, the, so the working capital management, again, it's just that um, focusing on cash, inventory, receivables, and short-term liabilities to make sure everything's going the way we want it to. Uh, each of the levels of those accounts is not too high, too low, and so on. So what they're going to do is give us an example for Ski Inc. And they're showing us various ratios for Ski compared to the industry average. Um, and some are better than industry average. Uh, several are not. Several are actually maybe not so great. Uh, but they're just showing us various ratios for ski compared to the industry average as you can see here and it says here how does ski's current assets investment policy compare with its industry um, so current asset investment policy is reflected in the current ratio turnover of cash and securities inventory turnover in days and sales um, it would say that it has a large amount of working capital relative to its level of sales it's either very conservative or very inefficient so we'll go back and take a look at that and you can see their current ratio is lower than industry. And so that's higher is better with that one generally. Uh, their turnover of cash and securities is lower, which means it's not as good. They have more debt to compared to assets than industry average. Um, one thing that should stand out to everybody is the day sales outstanding. It's basically how long does it take to collect. Industry is 32. We're at 45.63. Our inventory turnover is how quickly do we sell our inventory, higher is better. Um, we're well under industry average. Um, fixed asset turnover isn't too bad, it's a little bit under. Total asset turnover is low, probably because a combination of inventory and fixed asset together. Our profit margin is too low, our ROE is too low. So you can kind of see here that um, the current asset investment policy, the current ratio of turnover of cash, inventory turnover and day sales outstanding isn't good. Uh, again, they're either really conservative or inefficient. I'll probably go with inefficient as the answer. Um, and it says here, um, a conservative or relaxed policy may be appropriate at least to greater profitability. However, we've already established that their gross profit ratio, their profit margin is 2.07 versus 3.5. So we can probably say that's not the key. And in fact, they probably just have some things they need to focus on in terms of efficiency, uh, which should be excessive current assets. So it's probably safe to say they have too many current assets and most likely too much receivables because their day sales outstanding is high and too much inventory because their inventory turnover ratio is low. So there's really about three main approaches when it comes to working capital moderate aggressive conservative and moderate says just match the maturity of assets with the maturity of the financing so if i'm going to buy inventory and finance that i would use short-term financing if i'm going to buy property plant and equipment that'll be around for a while i'll use some type of long-term financing i'm just going to match 
um, the duration of the asset to the duration of liability. Aggressive is I'm going to use short-term financing pretty much for everything, um, even permanent assets. And so think more property applied equipment. Um, conservative means I'll use permanent capital for permanent assets and temporary assets. So with conservative, I'm using more long-term financing for everything. With aggressive, I'm using more short-term financing with everything. Moderate, I'm just matching the duration of the asset with the duration of the liability to finance it. So there's no right or wrong to the approach you take. Um, it's a matter, again, of company preference, risk tolerance, and po possibly, too, and, and in fact, probably, um, your, whatever industry you're in would dictate some of that, too. So here's an example of the moderate policy. And what I want you to kind of notice is that this says permanent CA, which just means current assets. And the top one means temporary current assets. You can kind of see this fluctuation. So imagine that this is a retailer, right? And just kind of think with a retailer, you know, when the Christmas season arrives, so kind of that November, December time period, um, and they're selling inventory that's seasonal, they've already bought it. You know, quite often they've already arranged to have that delivered in August, um, September. They have it on hand. They're not going to release the ads until they know what they have on hand. So they've already had to buy that and finance for that. So the question then is, how do we finance that? I'm not going to sell it for a few months. How do we do that? And again, that's, it's a matter of preference. However, it's safe to say that all stores, when we walk into a store, think a grocery store, Hy-Vee, Walmart, whatever it would be, we pretty much expect the shelves to be full. You know, unless the week they got slammed over the weekend or there was a major storm coming, everybody goes and shops. We kind of expect there to be full shelves, right? And so you can kind of safely say there's a certain amount of inventory you just have to have on hand, basically whatever it takes to keep your shelves full. Then you have the seasonal stuff on top of that. You know, so if it's uh, the Christmas season, uh, the spring season, summer season, whatever that would be. We obviously have to ramp up and require inventory for that, and it sells out. Then we ramp up for the next season and so on. So that's kind of the, the circles here, the half circles that you see the seasonality. But we always have to have a certain level of permanent current asset on hand. Inventory, an inventory base or inventory level that we need to have on hand. So the question is, how do we pay for that? Well, what we can decide is, because inventory to some degree is permanent, Maybe I can use some long-term financing for that. So long-term financing means stocks, bonds, and spontaneous current liabilities, which is your, just your accounts payable. Or we could use short-term loans to pour, you know, pay for a portion of it, which is what we're doing here. And we're using short-term loans to pay for that seasonality. You know, so it's a line of credit, something like that, that I'm tapping into so I can buy inventory for the Christmas season, for the summer season, whatever it would be. And then on the flip side is the conservative financing policy, where I'm just using long-term uh, financing for everything um, and almost no short-term debt. So I'm using um, stocks, bonds, and then spontaneous current liabilities, which is my accounts payable. You know, obviously, if I'm a, I'm a merchant and a supplier says, you can buy goods from us and don't pay us within 30 days, I'm going to do that, right? I mean, it'd be crazy not to. I'm not going to pay them on day one. I'm going to pay them closer to day 30 so I can save my money. And every business does something like that. Okay, so the cash conversion cycle is kind of the big formula for this particular chapter. And it focuses on how long before a sale is made and cash is received. So the cash conversion cycle the length of time, so it's about days, we're going to compute a number of days, between a company makes a payment to its creditors and when a company receives payments from its customers. So what's that time difference? So you can see there's kind of three sections to the formula. The first one is the inventory conversion. The second is average collection. And the last one is payables deferral period. So it's just trying to measure how long does it take to convert inventory to a sale then how long does it take to actually collect on that sale? And then how long do we take to, to pay our bills off? Okay, so it's kind of that process. Now, you know, kind of thinking in, in terms of more like a high V or a Walmart, 
they're not selling on account, right? Maybe to a few select business customers, but the vast majority of their sales are going to be um, cash, debit card, credit card on the spot, right? So there's really no average collection period. So this would apply more to a wholesaler, to a manufacturer or something like that, where they've got inventory, they're selling it on account. They have to wait for the customer to pay them. And of course, they have to pay their bills. So it's kind of just managing that process to get the most efficient number. And typically, the shorter, the better. You know, obviously, that kind of makes sense. So this gives you an example of, of the formula here. And so what they do here is they take the inventory conversion and show you how to compute that, which is date, days per year divided by inventory turnover. So we just use 365. And in the couple slides ago, we looked at all their ratios. And we said that their inventory turnover is 4.82. So that means it takes 76 days to convert their inventory uh, to, into a sale. We then put add that to be day sales outstanding, which is the 46 days, which again came from the pre, uh, few slides ago. So let's go back to slides four right here. So I just want you everybody to see that here's my inventory turnover 4.82. And these rounded my day sales to 46 even. Oops, went too far. There we go. And then our payables deferrable period. So we just know that, you know, when we buy goods from our suppliers, the vast majority of our bills have a 30 day due date. Then we just use the 30 days. So we get to 92 days, which is three months, you know, so that's one way to kind of look at that and go, um, you know, is that good or bad? Well, my guess it would be bad because we're really bad at, about converting our inventory. We're really bad at collections. So I'm going to guess that's not a great number. Okay. Um, and how to minimize cash holding. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind, you want your cash to work for you, right? You want to get your cash as fast as you possibly can. And what a lot of businesses do is they use what they call a lockbox. And so, um, when they bill your company, when they send out a bill, um, basically the customer writes a check and that gets mailed to a P.O. box. And that P.O. box every day is emptied by your bank. So essentially your bank every day is collecting for you. The banker goes to the post office, empties your box, takes um, those envelopes back to the bank, deposits the checks on the spot and lets you know how much the deposit was. They also give you the remittance advices so that you know what customers paid you and so on. So a lockbox is just a way to get your money into your bank faster as opposed to if that came to my business, I had to process that and then go and make a deposit. So we're kind of just making that a little bit faster. And of course, the second one right here is a really simple one. Um, give a discount, give a preference to customers that pay you with some kind of a, a transfer, a wire transfer. Um, a lot of businesses use ACH, it's called Automated Clearinghouse. It's a really easy way to just transfer money between different bank accounts. It doesn't have to be within the same bank, it can be any other bank. Um, and then um, debit cards, credit cards, and so on. Um, so if we can go about that process, that will speed it up too, instead of waiting for a check, and then that check has to get deposited, we have to clear the bank, and so on. And then you can try the best you can to synchronize the inflow and outflow of cash. Easier said than done. I've tried to do that before with, with a couple of businesses. Um, you can try to do that, but it's not easy. Uh, reduce the need for safety stock of cash, right? So if we can get really good at forecasting our cash needs um, and kind of predicting our seasonality, for example, we can get to the point where we know what times of year we'll either have more cash on hand that we can invest or we'll need more cash that we can make sure we've got some cash on hand to reduce the amount of borrowing that we need to do. So just kind of going through a good forecasting process. Um, also keep in mind that cash in the bank really does not earn you a high rate of interest at all. Very, very little interest. So the point is to put as much cash as you can into something else that will give you a higher rate of return, like marketable securities. Um, even a money market mutual fund of some sort um, pays about 1%, whereas a checking account or a savings account might pay, you know, just 0.01% or, you know, well below 1%. So having something in uh, an investment vehicle that's still relatively safe, at least gets us a return, is better for us too. And the lines of credit are really good. 
And a line of credit is basically you've got a loan agreement with the bank and the bank just says, okay, we've approved you for a loan. You just tell us when you want to draw the money out and you don't, you never have to, but you just call us or log online onto your account and transfer money out of your line of credit into your um, operating uh, checking account or your savings account. Um, so it's very easy to do. There's a fee for that even if you never use it because the bank has to have reserves set aside to cover that loan on a, you know, in an instant. So they still charge a fee even if you never use it, but it's good to have as a backstop if something unforeseen happens with your business and maybe some critical piece of equipment cocks out or whatever and you need to replace it or, you know, right away, a line of credit could help. Um, maybe you're going to get a really good deal with one of your suppliers if you buy a large quantity of inventory from them and you don't have the cash but you kind of figure if I can use my line of credit to buy it and I'm still better off, you know, things like that. Just as um, emergencies come up where you get some seasonality where you, you want that extra cash on hand to be able to tap into. So the other part of the chapter kind of deals with the cash budget. It's just trying to figure out um, my cash in and my cash out, focusing very much just on cash, not accruals, you know, not revenues earned or expenses incurred, but rather just literally cash in and cash out. When will cash be coming in? When will cash be going out? And depending on the type of the business, this could be done daily, weekly, monthly, for some businesses, you know, this is a really critical thing, managing cash. Others, they can kind of just do it month by month or do a full year, monitor that and so on. So it just depends on the business, the size of the business, what your industry is, as to how often you'll do this. But the point is, if you've got a good handle on your cash budget, it helps you manage the business better and become more efficient. And it allows you to add value to the firm, which is kind of the point of the class. So this is just a very simple cash budget for two months. We start out with the beginning cash balance, uh, or I'm sorry, not the beginning balance, but uh, in January of collections of 67651, purchases, most likely inventory, things like that, wages to our employees, rent, and total payments. So we've got a net positive cash flow of 13857. Then we do the same thing for February, collections, purchases, wages, rent, Payments are lower here, and we've got net positive cash flow in February of 18,000. So it's just kind of doing that process and rolling it through. So what they do next is they go, January's got a balance of 3,000, because that was our opening balance on January 1. We just projected that we should have a positive 13,857 of cash. So my cumulative cash is 16,857. My goal is to have a minimum of 1500 in the bank. Um, so that's a surplus of 15357. Then do the same thing for February and so on. So by the time I get to the end of February, I'm projecting a surplus of over $33,000. Now keep in mind with business bank accounts, um, if you don't maintain a minimum balance of a certain amount, they charge more fees. Business bank accounts charge more fees than personal bank accounts. Um, you know, banks are pretty good, most banks, about having no fee checking and savings accounts because they just want you as a customer because if you've got your check and your savings that means you'll most likely go to that bank for a loan a credit card you know home mortgage whatever it would be they got you as a customer but for businesses especially a business that has a lot of transactions where you're doing ACH payments and uh, collections and so on through the bank they will charge you a, a more fees but the bank typically wants a minimum balance. Um, otherwise, if you dip below that balance, the fees even go up more. So usually there is some kind of a minimum balance based on what the bank kind of requires of us. Um, so how could bad debts be uh, worked into a cash budget? So obviously if I sell an account as my business, there's a high likelihood that not everyone will pay me back. Even if I've got really good credit policies or just things you can't predict, um, that eventually somebody's not going to pay me back. And so we need to be realistic with the cash budget. If, if our experience is that if we sell a dollar on account, that on average 97 cents is collected, we need to focus on that. We need to, you know, that should be our collections then. So if basically overall 97% of sales that are done on account are collected, not 100%, I go with that, right? Because that's what is real. Of course, I should always be trying to improve that number and doing what I can to do that. 
but I also need to be realistic with it too. So uh, they're going to give us um, their forecasted cash budget and um, basically just we'll say they're holding too much cash. And you can kind of see now they used, I forgot to fix this, but they put October, November here, even though they told us it was January and February. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody caught that, but right here we're doing January, February. And keep in mind they've got 33,000 of excess cash, you know, more than 33,000. Um, and that's a lot of cash. Um, so the goal should be to do something with that cash. Um, so it says here they could improve their EVA, economic value added, by either investing that cash, um, even in marketable securities, in stocks or bonds, um, returning cash to shareholders. Um, that would be by either paying dividends or buying shares of stock back. Those are all things that would improve its economic value added. Sometimes companies do carry a large amount of cash on purpose. Um, maybe they're worried about future sales. Maybe they're uh, forecasting that sales may go down. Um, maybe there's an opportunity to do something with that cash, maybe to add a new location, buy some new equipment, buy out a competitor. Maybe there's a goal. Maybe they're building that up with one specific goal in mind. Okay, so, but just kind of keep in mind that um, sometimes businesses do keep a large amount of cash on hand for a very specific reason. When it comes to inventory, um, you know, the challenge with most merchants and manufacturers is to not carry too much inventory because there's a holding cost to holding too much, but not holding too little because then you lose sales. Okay, so there's a happy medium in there somewhere. So the more inventory I carry, um, some states and some cities charge a property tax based on the value of your inventory. Um, some do, some don't. Um, of course, sometimes we have property tax, I mentioned property tax, it depreciates, goes obsolete, may spoil, go out of season, out of style, things like that. I have to store it, obviously. There's ordering costs every time I order something. There's a cost, your shipping, handling, uh, purchasing person has to process orders and so on. And there's, of course, the, the costs are running short. I lose sales, customers get angry. If it's a factory, it messes up my production schedules and so on. So reducing inventory levels will reduce inventory uh, carrying costs, but it would also increase ordering costs and may increase the cost of running short. So there's a, a happy medium that's really hard to figure out sometimes. So the question is, are they holding too much inventory? And the answer would be, yeah, because their inventory turnover is so low. It's 4.82 versus 7. That's a big difference. And so what that means is they have too much inventory on hand uh, for the amount of dollars that they, uh, dollar of sales that they have. Um, so that, you know, obviously increases carrying costs. Um, the odds of that going old, going obsolete, out of style go up and so on. Um, so too much working capital is invested in inventory and we need to figure out, you know, why that is and how to fix that. So the question here would be, what if they can fix that? Maybe they come up with better, uh, a software that can help them manage their inventory better. Um, or maybe they have some just old inventory they just need to dump, you know, just write it off or mark it down and get rid of it. Um, whatever they need to do, they need to do something. Let's just say they figure it out. So they positively reduce the inventory balance. And when I say positively, I mean they do that in a way that does not impact sales. So the goal is to reduce inventory, but yet still have enough inventory on hand to meet sales. So in the short run, cash will increase because we're not going to be buying inventory, right? So we're going to stop buying inventory for a while while our current level goes down. So cash will go up. In the long run, the company is likely to take steps to reduce its cash holdings and increase EVA, economic value added. And excess cash then can be used for other things, right? It's a great problem to have when you have too much cash, right? There's a whole lot of good things we can do with that. You know, a, a lot of choices. Again, it could be pay off debt, um, invest in more efficient or more productive assets, expand, launch a new product line, add new locations, return that extra cash back to shareholders through dividends or repurchasing stock. Tons of options are available for us. So the next question is, do SKI's customers pay more or less promptly than those of its competitors? 
I think we've already established that our customers are slow. Um, they're paying us in almost 46 days versus 32 days for the industry. So we need to tighten that up, right? And we need to, we need to do that in a way that does not um, alienate our customers either, right? We want to collect on time, but we don't want to upset our customers either. So that's, those are some things to kind of consider. So some of the items that go into credit policy is how much time do we give our customers to pay us? You know, they're not telling us what the average is. Let's just assume it's 30 days because that's usually the, the standard for most companies. Um, you know, we can negotiate that. You know, we could decide to make that be 45 days if we want to. Um, we could make that be 20 days. We have to be also be thinking about our competition. If our competition offers 45 days and we offer 30 days, that's a problem. We kind of have to usually match the competition. Um, but the longer we let people pay us back, then that hurts our cash, right? If we have to wait longer to collect. We could offer a cash discount, right? That Like that 210 net 30. If you pay me within 10 days, I'll give you a 2% discount or whatever, whatever we think would be best. Obviously, that may attract new customers and it will definitely get people to pay us faster, but it does lower our price. We're just shaving some money off of our price. We have to think through if that makes sense. Our credit standards, how restrictive or how you know liberal are we with our credit policies? Do we give credit to anybody? Are we very selective? You know, that would be a part of it too. And then the last one is the sensitive one to me is how tough are you on your collections, right? Um, you know, do you charge a penalty or a late fee or not? We have to kind of think that through too, because the goal is to collect on time, but yet not damage customer relationships. So it's a kind of a fine line to walk with that. Um, it says, does Steve face any risk if it restricts credit policy? Absolutely does. Of course it does. They may lose customers, right? They may lose customers. They might just say, you know what? I don't like you guys. <laughs> I'm going somewhere else. So you have to balance that benefit of fewer bad debts and the cost of and the cost of possibly losing some sales. So that's the hard part, right? And that's just maintaining relationships, um, speaking to your customers, being open and honest with them. And working on it from that perspective it can be done it just requires some effort on, on on ski or whatever the business is so if they can reduce the day sales outstanding without adversely affecting sales how does this affect the cash position well in the short run the customers pay sooner this increases cash holdings um, this will reduce financing or target uh, cash balance needed in the long run, over time, the company would hopefully invest the cash in more productive assets, right? And you know, finding more efficient ways to deploy assets. Again, uh, buying better machinery, um, investing in technology, launching new product lines, expanding things like that, or giving money back to shareholders. So there's lots of ways to do that, but um, it's, there's a short run benefit and a long run benefit. Okay, so trade credit then is create credit furnished by our suppliers right so when we buy goods if i'm a grocery store or a manufacturer and i'm buying goods from my suppliers you know i'm kind of relying on trade credit so that hopefully i can sell the good that i just bought on account before the bill is due and i have to pay for it okay so it's spontaneous um, easy to get but the cost can be high if we don't pay on time now, for smaller firms, trade credit is usually one of the largest sources of short-term financing. It's just, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a retailer, small retailer. I can't afford to buy the inventory for cash up front. I need to negotiate with my suppliers, ship me the goods, give me 30 days to pay you back so that I have a chance to sell these goods. I can collect on those before... I got to pay you the money due, right? That's what most smaller and even larger retailers are trying to do. So the next calculation is the cost of trade credit. It says here a firm buys $3 million net at 110 net 30. So 110 net 30 means we can take 1% off the bill if it's paid within 10 days or the net amount is due within 30 days. So the gross amount is 3 million 303. And it says the firm can forego discounts and pay on day 40 with no penalty. So even though the bill is due in 30 days, we know with this particular supplier that we can pay in 40 days 
and it's not a problem. Uh, so net daily purchases 3 million uh, divided by 365 is 8,219. So that's our daily purchase, that net amount divided by 365. So if the payables level, or our accounts payable, if we always take the discount and pay within 10 days, it'd be about $82,000. If we don't do that and we pay on day 40 so that we keep our cash as long as possible, our payables will be 328,767. So the difference between the two is what we call costly trade credit, right? I'm foregoing that 1% discount when I do that. That leads us to the nominal cost of credit. So basically that 0 0.01 of the gross amount, $30,000 worth of discounts are lost so that I can get an extra $246,000 worth of credit, which is 12.29%. Okay, and so the rule of thumb here is even if we cannot afford to write a check on day 10, we're better off borrowing. Um, in today's interest rate environment, a line of credit, 5-6% would be probably on the high side, depending on what our credit is for our business. We're much better off taking advantage of the discount rather than paying on day 40 because 12.29% is a very high interest rate to pay for that credit. I can get a better rate at the bank and then borrow from the banker. And I tell the banker, I'm borrowing from this line of credit so that I can pay my inventory within the discount period. Bankers are okay with that. They like to hear that. Okay, so that get that, so the whole formula then is right here, how we just computed that. You'll use this formula in your homework, so just be aware of it. This is slide 30, so if you want to make a note, slide 30 is the nominal cost of credit um, cost of trade credit formula. So you can see it right here, what we just did. You'll get a few of those in your homework this week. Um, so the effective cost of credit, now I'm going to take that and basically turn it into the effective rate using the EAR formula. And we looked at that formula way back um, in chapter five. Um, that was the present value future value chapter. I get 3.01%. So uh, the effective annual rate, so the nominal rate was 12. Um, 29, the effective rate is actually 13. Okay. And so obviously a bank loan, this example, it says, you know, uh, what if I could just borrow at 8%? Well, yeah, that, that'd be better off. Um, there's a couple of ways to do um, interest calculations for banks. There's simple interest or installment loan, they call an add-on. Um, either way, it just depends on the bank. Simple interest is really easy, which is the interest rate times the principal, and that would be for one year. Okay, so basically if I borrowed $100,000, uh, simple interest for a year is 8% is $8,000. That's an easy one to do. Um, there's what they call add-on interest also. Um, so it's 8% times the principal of 8,000. We add that to the face amount. So now we're borrowing 108,000. We divide that by 12 to get 9,000 per month. And so my average loan balance outstanding is the principal of 100 divided by two which is 50,000, so the cost of my financing goes way up in that example. It's 8,000 divided by 50 is 16%. And then um, I need to find the effective rate on that, which using the EAR formula, we get to 15.45. Okay, so you might have a few questions that'll deal with that. Okay, so anyway, that was chapter 15. If you have any questions about that, just let me know. Thanks.